moving it up to $80,000 a year. Uh, so for us, we contextualize financial aid as tuition justice. Uh, so much, all our conversation right now is about financial resilience, uh, talking about money, uh, resources, and Brookdale is proud to really be providing this resource to contextualize our conversation. So one thing that I wanna share is this website, brookdalecc.edu uh, slash tuition free. And I'm gonna drop all of this in the chat. So all of you know this resource, I'm asking for all of you to please share this information. All you have to do is come on this website and I will drop it in the chat. It gives the eligibility requirements and 65,000 is about to become 80,000. And if you sign up for one of these three sessions, we have them all through till the end of April, you will be in a, you can uh, schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a person to offer you information. We also help you fill out your financial aid forms. All this information is available to you. Just wanna, you know, this is such a, I wish I had, I didn't have this. I'm a first generation college student. Uh, so I had to stumble my way through this uh, largely alone. Uh, so we really wanna be a resource and we really wanna be available uh, to offer support to everyone in the community. I'm gonna drop a message in the chat with all of these links. All right, uh, including my email address, I am available to all of you. I'm looking forward to collaborating. Any ideas or any, any collaborations that you might be ideating, please connect. Uh, financial resilience is an area of focus for diversity and inclusion at Brookdale Community College. So this collaboration with Brunch and Budget is extending, it started last semester with how, to, how not to be a broke college student and is coming into this semester with the series, Five Stages to Your Financial Legacy. Brunch and Budget, we honor you. We thank you for your time, your talent, and your generosity. And now I'm gonna turn the mic over to you. Please show us the way. Thank you, thank you thank so much. You. We're happy to be here. Oh, Sasha, at the, the, the last minute with Love by Music Soul Child. <laughs> so many people use your name in vain. <laughs> I feel like that, that's real similar to our finances, right? We, we, have, we don't have great relationships to these things because we, we, we're afraid to say it. Mm. So let's get up into our stuff. This today is going to be about financial safety. We are talking about financial resilience, what Angela mm -hmm. was bringing up, and that's really important stuff. You know, uh, resilience has become a buzz term in academia, and I noticed that a number of teachers and administrators are like, we shouldn't use that word anymore because it implies that we go through stuff with money. But y'all, we go we through, go through stuff with money. <laughs> let's call it out let's be real about it there are best practices there are tips there are strategies what we're going to help y'all do is understand how to weather the storms while figuring out how to make the more that you want yes this is the first of five workshops this is the five workshop series and it's going to be every wednesday at seven so this is the first one we're so excited that you're here thank you for joining us before we jump in quick disclaimer brunch and budget is a registered investment advisor which means that please do not construe anything that we share today as financial advice. It is for educational purposes only. Yeah, you know, the real is we don't know enough about your personal financial situation to give you accurate advice, and we don't want to do you dirty. I know that a lot of times fine print exists to play you, but in this case, it's here to protect you. Yes. And we'll be sending you the slides and the recording through Angela. We will send her all of the stuff. And if you RSVP'd, you will get all of this information as a follow up. This is a slide Yay! that we like to share a lot <laughs> with folks. Uh, these are our expectations about everything, but especially stuff about finances. Like yeah. when it comes to our finances, everybody tells you that you're supposed to go to the right school, get good grades, get the right internship, meet the right people, and then you're rich. You're done. That's how it works, right? The reality is a lot more messy. It looks like the squiggle on the right. And what I want y'all to know about, it's not just about how our finances are messy because we have ups and downs. We have to get the resilience so we can understand how to deal with these things. Also, all the stuff that we talk about today and over the next few weeks is going to be a big old mess. Some mm -hmm. of it, you're going to be able to relate to it right now and you're going to be able to apply to it. Some of it, you won't be able to apply right now because you have life getting in the way, because you get busy, because you get tired, because you get bored, because you get distracted. It's all right. We just want you to keep your eye on the big black arrow in the front and not 
look at too much of the silly strings that yeah. leads us to the place that we're going. And remember, the expectation is financial literacy, but the reality yeah. is financial resilience. And we're here to help you figure out how to keep moving forward despite any setbacks that you have. Right. All right, so I am Pamela Capallad. I'm a certified financial planner and accredited financial counselor. I've been in the financial services industry since 2008 when the Great Recession first started. I saw the whole thing happen. Um, I am the founder of Brunch and Budget, which is a full service financial planning practice and the co-founder of Pocket Change, which is a hip hop and finance program for youth. And hi, my name is Dialect. I'm the director of pedagogy at Pockets Change. I have been an educator and a creative freelancer for about 20 years mm -hmm. now. All of the stuff that you hear us go through, you might be like, well, mm, some of this stuff, I, I don't know if I know how to do this. I might do that wrong. It's fine. I did it wrong three times when we could talk about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We invite you to not save your questions until the end. Mm -hmm. This is not that kind of workshop. We want this to be a conversation. So as questions come up, as we go over any content, please share them with us. We're looking at the chat and we'll answer them as we go. Also, like we were saying about the information earlier, a lot of the time when you ask questions, and please feel free to ask specific questions, but the answer is probably going to be, it depends because there are a lot of different situations, but sharing your questions as well as the situations that you've gone through, your statements and stories will be helpful to everybody in the community. Yes. And we got DJ KK47 in the house. KK47 is the people's DJ, a social worker and activist, artist, great musician that does a lot of wonderful stuff. Please feel free to book KK for all of your funky groove and moving needs. Yes. Virtual, in person, wherever. So Brunch and Budget, as we mentioned, it's a full service financial planning practice that literally started with me trading food for advice from my friends. We're part of a big artist community and I was the only finance friend. I was in finance and people found out and they would pull me aside at parties and say, what's an IRA? I need to check my credit score. I've, you know, I, I'm so afraid to look at my money, right? And the thing about Brunch and Budget is it's a place for us to find common ground, to break bread, and to really have real conversations around money. And Brunch and Budget exists now as a full financial planning service. We have the Sea change groups specifically for people of color. We've got the podcast. It's available for everybody and free. We have a number of different ways that we can reach you. Yeah. One of the things that's really important for us to learn as we go through all this is to remember that getting a hold of your personal finance is a form of revolution. A lot of the stuff that we're going to be teaching you isn't a way to break yourself free of the financial shackles, that capitalism and being an American, all the things that go along with it. What we will help you do is be able to get your head above water so you can think about the changes you want to make in life. If you're trying to go and live off the grid, you need to get a base before you can go and do that. If you're trying to change the game, you need a base before you can do that. If you're just trying to live through this system and have a nice day, these basics will give you the base so that you can start to do that. Yes. So we're going to be talking about all of them throughout this series, aligning your spending with your values, prioritize having a savings cushion. Yes, even above paying down debt that is coming up in the next workshop. Yeah, yeah. Well, we get deep into score. that next time. We do. Learning how to invest, filing your taxes. How many people have back taxes? We've had a lot of clients who've had that and been like, I can't, I feel like I can't move forward. Yo, right? freelancers, especially mm -hmm. artists, ooh, we've been given so much bad advice on hand to hand our taxes that it puts us in arrears. Yes. And having an estate plan, we are definitely going to be focusing on that in one of the workshops. It's not, it's not just about accumulating wealth. It's also about protecting it and being able to pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. So with all that said, what we're going to be going through through these five financial stages is first the safety stage, which is today. Then the sustainability stage. Stability stage. Oh, excuse, excuse me, stability. Then sustainability. Fine, it's fine. I know. Then financial <laughs> independence. And then once we're free about the legacy. Yes. And Karen, who said, yes, I need help investing. We definitely have tons of workshops and podcasts on that as well. Mm -hmm. There are a number. We mentioned the podcast earlier. So if you want to do a few deeper dives into the stuff that we just bring up here, and we also have interviews with people a bit smarter than us who can explain some of these concepts. Yes. If you want to follow along, we have a worksheet that will apply to all five of the workshops coming up. Dialect is typing the link in the chat, bit.ly slash BNB stages. I got to put that HTTP in front of it so that they- Oh yeah, so there's so a it's little click, link. So it's clickable. So it's you know, I always be forgetting <laughs> to do that, John. And the two slashes and everything. Yeah. So yes. uh, feel free to do that, uh, take that, make a copy so that you can make it yours and input all the text that is helpful to you. Again, if you're a note-taking type of cat, 
this will be great for you if you need to do this afterwards because trying to do that stuff distracts from what you got going on. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Yes, absolutely. All right, so we're gonna go through all five stages um, and what they look like, and then we're gonna focus on safety. So financial safety, what does that look like? So financial safety looks like you're unsure where your money is going and your bills feel like they're out of control. You have debt and not only you have debt, you feel like you're in debt. It's unmanageable. You have little to no savings or the savings you have disappears every time you get it. And you need to create a foundation, a base, like we were saying earlier. Yeah. So the goals when you're in the financial safety stage are about starting to save regularly, organizing your bills, your credit and your debt, just knowing where everything is and building habits. That's a huge thing with financial safety, as well as starting to learn financial terms and feeling comfortable advocating for yourself. Also in the financial safety stage, you may find as you're organizing everything that you do need to find ways to increase your income. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know a lot of this is much easier said than done. And that's one of the things about the safety stage. It's like, it feels like it's like when you're watching Jeopardy at home and you're like, I know all the answers. Then you get up there in front of the lights and everyone. And, <laughs> It's, it's a lot. Once you get past the safety stage, you're going to be in stability. Yes. And that looks like having a savings cushion. So having money in savings regularly, your debt is not increasing. So you figure out a way to stop using debt. You start learning more about investing in the financial stability stage, but you still are one paycheck away from financial trouble. So it still feels like paycheck to paycheck, but there are things in place where you feel like you have a foundation. And this, by the way, is regardless of your income level, because Absolutely. even if you're getting a big income, if you don't know what you're doing with it, you can still be a paycheck away. We have clients who are in the six figures who are actually still in the financial safety stage, believe it or not. So that's why our goals are once we built some habits with the safety stage to maintain those habits, because if we don't maintain them, then, you know, What's the point? Increase these savings. Mm -hmm. Start creating a debt pay down plan, increasing your credit score as well in accordance to your timing for the stuff you're going to need to use it for. Building confidence in your investments because investments are a thing that even when we're doing it, it makes us feel like we don't know what we're doing yeah. for real. Put together some insurance, all the insurances you need and continue, always continue to increase income. Yes, insurance is all about protecting your wealth. Mm -hmm. So then we move on to the financial sustainability stage, the third stage. Stage. And what that looks like is you have established habits and you have savings mm -hmm. that are usually around three to six months worth. You can comfortably auto pay your bills, which is like the best feeling, right? Where you're like, oh, I don't have to worry about that bill coming out because the money is just going to be in my checking account. Your debt is decreasing and your retirement investments are increasing. So the things that are decreasing are going in the right direction. Debt is decreasing, retirement investments are increasing. And this is where things get a little bit more concrete. When you're in the sustainability stage, your goals are something more like saving for significant goals. And those are your trips, those are your houses, those are the six months off to write the great novel. Solidifying your estate plan, that's something that takes a long time to get together. Mm -hmm. So it's something you need to start when you're in this stage and then start to max out your retirement contribution so you can get ready for the next step. I feel like we're giving everyone a preview for like the next five workshops. That, the next that, four that, workshops. That's what I thought we were doing here. Yes. So after that, you are on the independent stage. And what that looks like is working because you want to, not because you have to, Ooh. which is like- You don't have to wait till retirement for that, y'all. Talk about easier said than done kind of yeah. stuff, right? <laughs> You're talking about not having credit card debt or not even really being worried that much about yeah. your credit cards and your credit card debt and having enough save that you can fund extended time off that you really aren't dependent on your income sources anymore for doing what you need to yeah, do. Yeah, this is like giving yourself a sabbatical, taking mini retirements, taking six months off, a year off to figure out what your next thing is. When you're in this stage, you have the ability to do that. Yeah, this is the thing where, you know, we're reaching into the area where our income is not the thing that's bringing in the money for us, that our investments are where we bring in our money yes. rather than the labor. So your goals in financial independence are to start exploring other investment opportunities outside of what you're currently doing to determine what enough is for you. Because that's the other thing too, is financial independence can be much closer than it seems because your version of enough might be lower than someone else's version. Yeah, you know, just like we were saying about how you could be in the safety stage with a six-figure income, you could not be in a six-figure income and still be heading towards the legacy stage. Yes, and what the legacy stage looks like is your investments are funding your lifestyle, you're contributing significantly to your community. So you have an understanding of what your values are in terms of how you want to share with your community. This is my favorite. You don't even need a credit score. That's how good you have it. It doesn't matter what your credit score is anymore. 
you just have access to things. Well, I mean, that's the thing where like, you know, people talking about like the hobnob and with the, the billionaires and the oligarchs is like, they don't actually, you ever got a business card from somebody where it just says their name? <laughs> <laughs> That's when you would not spot in the legacy stage. Yes. Your goals that are to formalize how you're going to show up for your family, for your community, for the world. What change, what power, what ways are you going to use the platform and the things that you've accumulated to make what you want to see happen in the world? This is how you're going to make your wealth generational. This is how you're going to pass it on. And this doesn't have to be Carnegie huge to be something that's significant. Yes, exactly. All right. So... A lot of this is going to be about you digging into yourself and asking questions and being real. So ask yourself why you are interacting with these systems. Ask yourself why you have to deal with health inequality, discriminatory practices, the racial wealth divide, actual factual capitalism all mm -hmm. up in your behind. Yeah. And then we want you to ask yourself about your relationship with money. Yes. So imposter syndrome, which we all have, right? habits understanding the thing about habits that's tough is habits are generational too right so things that you just do without thinking about it are probably things your parents did and their parents did and so examining that and learning and unlearning habits is going to be a big part of this mm -hmm. hustle and burnout so getting to the point where you're like i don't even have the time or the space or the room to think about this how can we build space how can we make room to prioritize this and internalized oppression, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and and another thing to, to bring up about the imposter syndrome stuff, that's definitely, while we all have it, it was given to you. It's mm -hmm. not like a thing that came natural in us. Like I know, speaking of internalized oppression. Bringing forth from our, our souls. Yeah, the that. thing that's so tricky about imposter syndrome is they call it a syndrome when really someone told us that in some way, whether directly or indirectly, right? Folks have been telling us that we can't do it so long that we start to believe them. That's just good listening. Yep. So uh, to talk about uh, the things that folks have been telling us for a long time, remember that historical racism has so much to do with historical and ongoing racism has so much to do with everything regarding finances mm -hmm. here in this country. It was the reason why it was built this way and it continues to be the reason. I think this has uh, been going, making the rounds a lot lately about how the reason why folks get paid so little and rely on tips comes from anti-blackness from way back in the day. There was this quote here, from this cat, I'm not even gonna say his name because you know, mm. for, forget that cat, but talking about how taking a tip is a token of your inferiority and people carry these Ooh. mindsets today. And it's one of those things that comes from anti-blackness and then affects even non-black folks. So even if you aren't black, you still have to worry about these things. Yeah. So this is a just a small piece of the systemic stuff that we're all really dealing with. And we want you to know about this kind of thing, that we all have these nagging feelings that it wasn't just us. And we want you to remember that you're not wrong, you're not stupid, and you're not alone. Yeah. All right, y'all, we got a little quiz for you. Yeah, to make you feel alone, here's a pop quiz. <laughs> It's real easy. It's a two question quiz and you can't get it wrong. Yes. So please share in the chat. Share in the chat your answers once you get one and two. It's just A or B for each one. So you'll be answering A, 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 B, B, A, or B, B. Yes. So question one, which phrase do you relate to more? Do you A, think more about what you have in the bank now and it doesn't feel real until it's in your account? Or B, are you usually spending the next check in your head before it hits your account? And then for two, which phrase do you relate to more? Do you A, tend to plan ahead? Or B, tend to deal with things as they come. Yes. And uh, KK, I'll throw on like a tune for like a couple seconds, or maybe I'll do it. I love all the A's. All these ones are here. Oh, of course, the A's. <laughs> the A's now are A. I was just talking about that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> ABs. I love it. I love it. Thank you all for your answers. Oh, this is good stuff. It's good stuff. Thank you so much for sharing these. Yeah, you know, uh, we're talking about the answer before we get to it. Should we? Are we ready? We're ready. Let's turn it on Let's over. Reveal the answers. So we didn't come up with the idea of this, but we have these money personalities and we've refined these for our purposes. The whole point of these is, you know, we have this idea that we are responsible or that our front of mind thinking our rationale is responsible for all of our financial decisions and really our subconscious does a whole ton of it 
Yes, when we're does. unaware of our subconscious and what it does with money, it tends to do its own thing. And then we follow after it. Understanding these money personalities is understanding these tendencies that you have. This isn't the totality of your being. And this isn't something that you have to worry about changing or finding the best one. These are just your tendencies. These are feelings you tend to have when you make purchases or you decide to save money. And if you have an understanding of them, you can better interact with them to get what you want. Yes, exactly. So keep your money personality in mind as we go through this. So if you answered A for one and A for two, you might be a complicator. Hi, complicators. I am also a complicator. Complicators, well, we complicate things a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm the type of person who triple checks to make sure that my bills are paid. I'm the type of person who has spreadsheets for my spreadsheets. I will spend three days researching to make sure I find the best dishwasher. I will also spend an hour trying to find a $5 off coupon for anything that I try to buy online. Mm -hmm. Oh, he seen me. I'm like, I well, gotta you know, find a coupon. Well, it, it's nice to like, feel like, you know, you're in control and you're, you're saving money. So like, wait, what's the downside? Well, the downside is sometimes we overcomplicate things. The downside is analysis paralysis. I will tell you, actually, I've been a complicator for a long time now. Mm -hmm. Since I was probably in middle school, I remember my parents didn't give me an allowance, but they used to give me $2 for lunch every day. And instead of spending the money on lunch, I would buy, I would buy a cookie for 50 cents and pocket the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Just in case. I was 11. I don't know what I was saving for. It was just in case. Nothing, actually. Well, and then when you turned 18, you bought your first house with that money. I did not. Or I don't know where that car, money went, y'all. I don't know where that money went. I do know, thinking back on that time, that my mom lost her job, but she didn't tell us. And so money just always felt tight, and I didn't know why. And I kind of felt like it was my fault. And that was the only way that I felt like I could have control of it. What we suggest to complicators is to try to find a way to let go of your yeah. finances. Make sure you pay attention to it, but you don't have to look at it every day. Start with finding one thing that you can set to auto pay. Yeah, one bill you that you can be like, here, I'm not going to worry about it. The algorithm got it. It's auto pay and I'm good. I used to be afraid to auto pay and now I do it all day long. I'm like, oh, wait, auto pay actually works. If you answered A for one and B for two, you might be a contemplator. Now, contemplators are just like the complicators. They're the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. Very smart about money, often thinking about money, but they don't want to. So mm -hmm. they push it aside. The contemplator, you know. Angela. Oh, I used to be suspicious of auto pay. Yo, contemplators yeah. are mad suspicious of <laughs> auto pay because contemplators are always like, well, wait, but I don't even know about it. And it's happened. It just happened in the background. I don't know about all of that stuff. But the contemplator is also the person who doesn't like to open the bill when it comes. Contemplator is someone who says, like, I know it comes on the first, but it's not due to the third. It's not late till the seventh. It's only a $5 fee until it gets to the tenth. <laughs> they got it all in their head and they're juggling it up so they can go take a walk and hang with their mm -hmm. friends. And what happens is, while as the complicator makes everything a priority, the contemplator makes nothing a priority. And then the priority is whoever is knocking at the door the loudest, which doesn't leave you in control. The thing about contemplators though, contemplators are great at improv. Mm -hmm. When it hits the fan, contemplators are in their element and know how to move and maneuver. Sometimes, and especially artistic contemplators, those are the ones who will put themselves in a position where they have to superhero their way out of it you may have known that artist friend who dated the person who was bad for them so they could get an album or a painting out of it <laughs> contemplators tend to do that with their money great though at improvisation and making it happen when mm -hmm. it's a mess contemplators we also suggest that y'all find a way to automate one of your bill pays but it's not so that you can let go it's so that you make sure you don't miss anything yes we ask y'all to auto pay your minimums mm -hmm. especially if you have on these credit cards auto pay these minimums because hey if it hits you and you go negative in your balance you'll be hit with whatever fee and that sucks but it doesn't suck nearly as much of having 7 years of broken mirror bad luck on your credit score yeah. for having paid something late. I like Sasha. I'm paying the last day before the late fee. She's mm -hmm. like, I know when that last day is and I know how far I can take it. That's what I'm saying. It's like ultimate procrastinators, but yes. it doesn't mean that you're dumb or you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. So, and Angela feels see. <laughs> <laughs> If you answered B for one and A for two, you might be a paper chaser and paper chaser solution to their money problems is I'll just make more money and we'll solve all my problems. Right. 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 You see, it makes it seem like this is the right money personality. But yo, <laughs> let me tell y'all, especially people who have worked for the city, when that $10,000 check is now six months late, what you going to do? <laughs> 
or with paper chasers, the thing that I've seen is they're like, I want something and my current job doesn't, uh, I can't afford it with my current job. So instead of saving for it, I'm just going to get another job. And I've had paper chasers have like five different jobs. So they're like, well, this money's going to go over here and this money's for this thing. And this money's to pay off the credit card debt for this other thing that I bought. Paper chasers often think that having money saved is a waste of that money and mm -hmm. that their money needs to be in motion and making money for them. <laughs> Tiffany, yep, guilty. Mm -hmm. Yep. You are so good at seeing opportunities and making money and figuring out how to keep the money in motion that it feels like having a pile of money sitting in savings is a waste. It feels like it's doing nothing. So what we ask you to do as paper chasers in particular is to figure out how to prioritize savings. And sometimes that might mean thinking about your savings account as another stream of income that you can tap into just in case your plans didn't go according to plan. That's what paying yourself first means. Yes. People be telling you all the time, pay yourself first. But you're like, what does that mean, pay yourself first? I got to pay bills. I got to pay yeah. for stuff I want. What do you mean? Paying yourself first is taking like an actual, here is a bank account that is yours and you're going to put money into it before you pay other people so you can take care of your future self. Exactly. Exactly. And if you answered B for one and B for two, oh, you might be a money monk. I'm a money monk. Guy. Yeah, you know, I, I'm a money monk. A lot of creatives, a lot of educators are money monks. And and a lot of money monks are the type of people who are like, I feel like all of these, because money monks tend to be chameleons, to disabuse you of this whole money changes people thing. It's not that money monks hate money. It's that we think of money as a tool. We think of money as a thing. And, you know, we don't have, it's not my money, it's the money, and I'm in charge of where it goes next. To be real about all of these money personalities, to get them to the money monk thing a little bit, a lot of this comes from pain and sometimes real for real trauma and it's our reaction to it. Um, I'm mixed race, which uh, matters for the sense, sake of the story. When I was 10, my dad died. My dad is white Jewish, my mom is black. And I found out that my dad's family was racist and they did everything they could to keep money out of my mom's wallet. And so we went broke, we couldn't have the place that we were living in, we had to move in with my, my aunt. And I acted like a paper chaser. I did everything I could to get money and had no idea or understanding of saving it because we were just trying to get there. By the time I was 17 and went out to college, I did hate money and I wanted to push it all away from me. The, any money that I did get, I would spend on my friends. I would settle disputes by just putting money down. I always had it outside of my hands as a contemplator. And I realized that I needed to engage my complicatorness and get the spreadsheets and get it together to do what a money monk wants to do, which is help the community which is help people, which is make change with money. And I realized that I wouldn't be able to make change with money. I wouldn't be able to save other little kids from the situation I was in if I didn't have any financial foundation myself. Yes, yeah. And Angela, intergenerational trauma informing our relationship to money, exactly. Yo, uh, I'm the director of pedagogy at the kids program, Pockets Change. We also don't teach kids that you should think that your parents were stupid or wrong or bad people with money because we've all been hit with this. Mm -hmm. We need to grow together. Yes. So again, keep your money personalities in mind as we go through the rest of this workshop, as we go through the whole series, because there are some things that are really going to resonate with your money personality mm -hmm. and some things that don't. And that's great. You know that and you don't have to try everything. Just straight up for my investment people, uh, money monks are probably going to be like, I don't know how I feel about investing. These companies are all terrible things. We did a two part series about how I don't like investments and I don't like the stock market, but I'm doing it anyway because these companies are already taking advantage of us. So we should be able to get some out of that too. Yep. Yep. So we were talking for a minute. Why don't y'all do your thing? KK is going to get on the wheels and play a couple of tunes for what, about two minutes? Mm -hmm. It's 7.35. We'll come back at 7.37. What do you need to feel like you're on the road to your financial legacy? Do you need income? Do you need more opportunities? Do you need a plan? What do you need to have? Yeah. Yes is our welcome. Yes. We don't talk about Bruno. Go on. Bruno says it looks like rain. What's he tell us? In doing so, he floods my brain. I will like the umbrella. Already in a hurricane. What a joy you stay, but anyway.
A mí me gusta trabajar, trabajar. Work all, get money, black cars, be fly. A mí me gusta trabajar, trabajar. I ain't play no games, yo no estoy por jugar. Yo no soy vaga. Tú sabes que yo soy mala. Oh, no. Thank you, DJ KK47. KK47. Blazing up, um, uh, Angela. I, I want your "We Don't Talk About Money" parody song. Yeah, we don't talk get some about drama money. department folks together. <laughs> knock that one out. We don't talk about money. I'm ready for it. So good. Thank you all for sharing this. Um, I know that a lot of this is asking you to be vulnerable about money stuff, which you were like, "Hey, I just came up here for some tips," and it's really important for us to be able to do that so that we can be honest with ourselves. Just like with everything else about like your health and all this kind of things, if you aren't real with yourself about where you're at with your money, you're going to keep butting your head against the wall. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. thank you all, really. Yes, thank you for sharing all this. I see a lot of people who need a plan, who need more income, who need opportunities. They have a plan, but they need another piece, better financial literacy, investing. This is all stuff that we're going to be talking about. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. All right, so if you go back to your worksheet, you'll see that at the top there's the stages, which we just talked about, and then there are the six money topics, and it's about mastering each topic at each stage. So the first topic is earning, income, taxes, career. We spend, I think, the sustainability workshop specifically on income and how to grow your income. Then we have spend, which is your bills and your discretionary spending. So this is about organizing and knowing where all of your money is and where it's all going. Then we have save, which is about creating savings milestones. I feel like that when it comes to saving, there's these like tips and rules of thumb. And we're going to talk about how to actually make it into bite-sized pieces. A thing that we Googled to see if anyone else had said it, and I guess they haven't, is that saving is an action word. You know, we think of saving as this thing that just sort of happens. It's the act of not spending. It's what you leave left over in your savings account. And that doesn't teach you the habit of saving and doesn't build you into being a good saver. And that doesn't create financial resilience. Saving is an active thing that you have to put thought, energy and effort towards. And that's something that we're going to be working on. Yes. Borrowing is credit and debt. So increasing your credit score, paying down debt, having a plan for paying down your debt, not letting your debt rule your financial life. This is very emotional and we really have to get into the difference between being in debt or having and using debt. And it seems yes. like such a simple thing, but just being able to flip the switch in your brain can allow you to have a different relationship with it and not have to deal with it when you don't want to deal with it. Yeah, if you want to go deep on credit and debt, we actually, uh, one of the workshops that we did with Brookdale last year that's on our website is about the credit and debt hustle and like learning how all those intricacies work. And then we have invest, which is stocks, bonds, and real estate, really understanding how, um, how to start investing, understanding the terms, and doing investing in a way that minimizes your risk and maximizes your reward. Oh, I want to shout out here. Um, I keep hearing wealthy people talk about leveraging debt, and I don't Ooh. understand what that means. Oh, yes. This is Thank exactly what we're saying. Yeah. Up. Yes, yeah. We're going to dig deep into it. You know, easy way to talk about this is to... Uh, you don't buy a million dollar house for a million dollars, even if you have a million dollars in mm -hmm. cash. You put down the down payment and then you get yourself on a mortgage and then you've got enough money left over that if something bad happens, you can handle it or you can put money down on another million dollar house. Yeah, exactly. So the, yeah, leveraging debt, one of the ways that we have the easiest access to it is a mortgage, mm -hmm. right? You get to buy a very expensive thing and take 30 years to pay it off. Yeah. Um, and I want to go back to Angela's comment. We have to oh, demystify yeah. the conversation. We are taught not to talk about money and the lack of transparency, transparency is intentional to keep us from sharing information. Yes. I, I think in your first job, didn't you have it in the contract? Yeah. That... If I shared my salary with another employee, I could get fired. And I worked. It's institutionalized, this lack of transparency well, and us not talking about it. The ill thing is it's everywhere. I've worked all sorts of contract jobs where we don't have those kind of clauses in there about talking about your salaries but nightclub owners mm -hmm. theater promoters everybody tells me hey if you start talking about how much money you're making with folks they're going to steal your gig they want us against each other yeah and we're not oh trina what is meant by stock splitting is this a good thing <laughs> oh yes now, because now, amazon amazon just, just split did their the stock. big split Tesla yeah. just split their stock i think google did it again Ooh, they like put in, I think they put in like bids to do it. So stock splitting is basically uh, stock has gotten too expensive for the average investor to buy. So to get more people able to invest in that company, they split the stock. So instead of one Amazon stock, 
um, you have, instead of one Amazon stock worth $2,000, for instance, you have 20 Amazon stock worth $100. It's a thing that they made up so that more people can give them money. It's like basically <laughs> yeah. inflation on a personal yeah. scale. Apple did that. That was the last big one that I remember, I think. Mm -hmm. Apple did that maybe like 10 years ago or something. And this is a time where like a lot of retail investors are like, oh, let me buy now because I can afford it. One it's thing that I will say about like, you know, is it a good thing or a bad thing? When it comes to the stock market, there's this idea that single events are going to make big changes in portfolios. But the stock market is more like a giant rampaging Leviathan. And <laughs> yeah. The entire beast, not just the teeth or the fins is what's going to move forward and, you know, get everybody their stuff or take yeah, away everybody's money. Exactly. NVDA. I don't know NVDA. Yeah. Yeah, so stock splitting is literally just saying instead of one share, now you have 10 shares and they're all worth, they're worth the same as the one share, but now it's split over 10 shares. Yeah, the, the tendency is that those shares are going to go up because they're splitting it because of demand. Yeah, exactly. That's the goal. So uh, Eleni asked, what is the equity involved in stock splitting? Like, do you have more equity? You don't have more yeah, equity. See, no, that's, it's, that's, that's a great that's question. Thing. That yeah. is a great question. Like, do you yeah. have more equity with one of the stocks versus the others? You don't, it's the same amount, it's the same dollar amount, but instead of owning one of them, you own however many they decide to split that one into. That's what you say about it being kind of fake. It's like kind of a fake tricky thing that they're doing to try and basically get more money from investors. Yeah, which brings us uh, as to bring us back a little bit to the money topics, investing stocks, bonds, real estate. What are you investing in and where are you allocating these this money that you got? Yes, and then the final topic is protecting. So make sure that as you accumulate wealth you're protecting it along the way and the ways to do that are insurance and estate planning mm -hmm. all right so back to the worksheet again if you just joined us or you haven't had a chance to download it the worksheet is bit.ly slash bnb stages i'm putting it in the chat again and then this is the full this is these are the categories and these are the stages the thing that we're looking at right now is the save category, the save topic. This is the thing where eventually you're going to be looking at all of them in mm -hmm. everything, but we think that it's important for you to start with a topic, figure out where you're at with this topic before you move on to the next one. When you start trying to do too many of them at once, it kind of gets to be noise in your head. Yes, exactly. And then Magali, what are the different classes of stocks, Admiral versus regular, for example? That is a good question. It is, it's how, um, uh, it's how expensive it is to buy the stock and yeah. then who has access to it. So that is a very detailed question that we won't be going over today, but we'll do it in a future workshop. Mm -hmm. So if you take a look at the save stage, uh, if you take a look at the save category in financial safety, it's all about building lasting savings habits. In financial stability, it's all about setting ambition savings milestone. So first you have habits, then you have those savings milestones, which are essentially your savings goals. And then by the time you hit financial sustainability, you're hitting significant savings milestones. And then when you get to financial independence, your savings is actually supporting your lifestyle. And by the time you get to financial legacy, your savings accounts are a symbol. You probably don't need to keep putting money in savings account anymore. And your savings are actually investments. Well, and that's the thing, you know, the savings that you're doing is going and growing and making things. You start off building your lasting saving habits with an idea. The idea leads to repeated action. That repeated action leads to it being a habit. And then it's just common sense. Yes. All right. So share in the chat, which stage do you think you're at right now in the save it's row? It's 745. We'll come back at 747. I'll we'll leave the stages and the saves all there for you.
Thank you, thank you again, uh, vulnerability and being real. Again, this is the stuff where you gotta be real with yourselves because they will determine the strategies that you're gonna make. Yes, exactly, exactly. So I see folks in like a good, yeah, I see folks in safety, stability, sustainability. Um, we have an interesting one here, financial safety. I have an IRA, but no other savings. Yeah, I was gonna That's, shout that out too. That Just to let you know, that happens a lot. Yeah, that happens a lot. And that also, the, the way to kind of think of this chart is to chart yourself in each stage for each category. So you might be in financial safety for savings, but maybe you're actually in financial stability for investing, for instance, because you have an IRA. Well, and all of this stuff starts off needing to be kind of concrete and needing to be kind of hands off and then it gets more hands on as you go and grow with it. So for a lot of people, you weren't going to save unless you had a company saying put together this account and then we're going to make it happen. For right, you. exactly, exactly. And then Kathy, I have decent savings with no plan to hit milestones. So it feels like a mix of safety and other stages. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. Yeah, I think having clarity on the milestones is something to really think about in terms of the intentionality of your savings. Because I know as a complicator, my instinct is to save because I'm afraid if I don't have money in the bank, then something catastrophic will happen. But I had no plans for it. And that's what happened to me when I was yeah. 11, was I was like, I don't know what actually happened to that money. I was saving just in case. Yeah, a student told me once, I thought this was so profound, if you don't make a plan for your money, your money is going to make a plan for you. And Ooh. that's what invariably happens. How many of y'all, I'll probably say this again, another one of these, but how many of y'all have gone to a place to buy a thing that you wanted and then you get to the register and they're like, we're out of stock and you end up spending that same money anyway. <laughs> you ain't even get the thing you want. Yeah. You know, our bodies are very primed to say, to spend money. And there are a lot of outside forces that help us do that. Yeah. Oh, Trader Joe's, Trader Joe's, Trader Joe's. <laughs> Trader Joe's. Them Trader Joe's Ikea spots. I mean, we could go deep dive on how yeah. they created pathways and whole things to make oh it God. so that's easy to do that for real target, target. oh target i don't, just don't go into target anymore why do they call it target because they, they got you <laughs> they, 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 they see you they you're get, the target they, they i guess exactly yeah. they go get you oh my gosh <laughs> right? leave, for real for real they just won't let and, you and out. again when we talk about plans for money i am 100 percent sure that there was somebody at target who was like we're gonna make it so that it's tough for them to leave without spending 100 bucks that's yeah, our goal it's true oh eleni i have always saved everything i could but due to fear and some money trauma i inherited but i still think i was in the financial safety stage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah well, no, just I because you haven't spent the money that's what i mean about the passive versus the active uh just because you haven't spent the money you have a bit, a bit of it sitting in your bank doesn't mean that you can replicate that yeah yeah, I know. Thank you for sharing that grocery Ooh. store, buying stuff for my children. Oh, yeah. When it comes the to mall. family, family really be getting you too. The mall is the ultimate. So savings really hard, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, it's we hard because be... really all of our social cues, like the cues. Yes. Oh, go ahead. You are really excited. No, no, yeah, no, no. Yeah, I, I love this one. This, <laughs> yeah, so I love excited. this one. and also don't love this one. So we do a lot of looking at behavioral science yeah. and trying to find all the real for real behind it. And we have zero social cues meaning like when you get rewards from people where we talk about saving money you will talk about spending money be like hey pam i bought this new hat right yeah. about this hat the only time folks have found researchers found this that we ever talk about saving money is going hey pam i saved money on this hat <laughs> no i didn't no i didn't i spent less money than i said i was going to spend that's not the same thing as saving yeah we don't get rewarded for saving socially so that's why it's so hard it's something that you're doing you're keeping yourself so if you're having a hard time saving find ways to celebrate when you do save all right so let's get concrete yes, here let's get concrete again starting with the concrete so we can get to the feelings part so when we're looking at the recipe for wealth for save right safety is talking about i'm building lasting saving habits right yes. the goal is that you're contributing to your savings regularly and what we want you to challenge yourself on is having getting that first thousand dollars and keeping it in there we call that a floor raising your floor back in yes. the day they wanted to raise the roof now we raise the floor <laughs> uh having a savings cushion of a thousand dollars and considering that zero you don't go beneath that for yes. any reason and two out of three americans do not have a thousand dollars in their savings account and i know some people are like well what if stuff happens that's actually a whole different account that we would like you to have like have that what if stuff happens savings account and then that other thousand that just sits yeah there. well and if that thousand ever goes down then you do everything you can to get it back up to a thousand and i know that sounds like a lot to some heads it's okay to start at i'm gonna have a savings cushion of a hundred yeah. and then and building that to a thousand 
Yeah. Then we have stability. So that looks like setting ambition savings milestones. Having the goal is to have at least one month's living expenses that you keep in a high yield savings account. And the challenge is to start figuring out what your one to three major concrete savings goals are. Then in sustainability, where you hit significant savings milestone, that means you can make major purchases and maintain your emergency savings. And the challenge is to create an ambitious timeline for one of those concrete goals that you have. Well, even when it talks about the ambitious timeline, that's starting in safety. When you're thinking about saving that thousand dollars, I want you to just not keep your eye. I think a lot of times they tell non-rich folks to just keep your head above water and tread mm -hmm, water. Mm -hmm. I want you to think of that thousand dollars as your first floor that you intend to raise. Oh yes, great question from Holly. Can you give us examples of concrete savings goals? Yes, yes. I love that question. So they can be either things or dollar amounts. So for some folks, the idea of having a dollar amount in savings, like that three months worth of living expenses in savings or six months worth of living expenses is motivating for them. And for some folks, it's I'm saving for a house. I'm saving so I can quit my job and you know take off for six months. I'm saving to be able to travel regularly every single year, those kinds of things. Yeah, and I also, I, I think that people should look at what one month's living expenses cost because you if you don't know, then you're just paying into something that you can't control. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, think of it as, are you someone who's motivated by numbers or motivated by specific things? Oh, and recommendations for high yield savings accounts. Great yes, question. Great question. Yes, we love Ally Bank. Ally Bank is great. Ally Bank is great because they recently eliminated all of their overdraft fees. They don't charge any fees big, at all. Big deal. Including overdraft fees. Barclays Savings is another one. Marcus by Goldman Sachs is another one. I know it's by Goldman Sachs. Yes. Yeah, but that's why I mention it. And then American Express Savings, if you're like, oh, I want a brand name. Yeah, well, you know, the thing about a lot of them is like a number of these online banks are made it uh, so that they're high yield and they're easily accessible. They're just not ones that you're able to go into and personally talk to somebody. So if that's a problem for you, you might not want to rock with one of those. Yes, and high yield, unfortunately, during the pandemic means half a percent, so 0.5% interest. It was around 2% before the pandemic, but it's still more than like your regular Chase's and Wells Fargo's, which are like, 0.01%. Yeah, yeah, I think Chase was 0 0.01 last time I checked. Yes. And, and as they raise, they'll raise for everybody. Yes. And Araceli, I have Ally and I love the buckets. Yes. yes. They have buckets. They have automated savings. They have digit like savings where they like learn your spending habits. It's pretty cool. Um, and then on the independent side for save, your saving supports your lifestyle. The goal is to have enough save to fund extended time off. And this again goes back to that concrete savings goal. That could be one of them. And the challenge is to really figure out what enough means for you mm -hmm. and really think about that because that will get you to the legacy stage where your savings accounts are a symbol and your savings accounts are repositories that you access. You can continue to live independently. And the challenge is to figure out how you want to distribute your wealth beyond your enough. This is the whole stage where these stages somewhere in this area is what we were talking about, about just working because you want to and not because you have to. This is where your investments are funding your lifestyle, your savings are funding your lifestyle mm -hmm. and your effort and your labor isn't necessarily, or yeah. doesn't have to. And it, where your effort and your labor don't have to directly be tied to income. You mm -hmm. can have effort and labor be doing different things in different places. And that's really exciting. So we're gonna talk today in the financial safety stage about how do you get to that first $1,000, mm -hmm. right? How do you build a $1,000 savings cushion? How do you keep it in there? Just telling you, first of all, this is much easier said than done, but we are gonna say it and then we are gonna do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So first things first, do you have a savings account? Now, and do you know how to use it? Yes. So opening a savings account, and we've had lots of clients who just don't have savings accounts or who have them open because they're open, but don't really use them. Mm -hmm. So most likely you have a hard time using your savings because it's the same bank as your checking account. Because when you open that app and when you open that bank app, you like look at your checking and you look at your savings and you're like, Okay, that's how much money I have to spend. Uh, I see Sasha is <laughs> already ahead of the game talking about I have two. Oh, yes. So I Love think it. contemplators and money monks may not like to hear this, but when it comes to having savings accounts, if you have your savings account in the same place as your checking account, you're just going to slide that money over. You are. It's way too easy. It transfers instantly. So we highly recommend 
having a savings account at a place that's different from your bank account. This is why we also recommend high yield savings accounts. Mm -hmm. If it's stressful, then that's good. I have my money in um, a credit union in Pennsylvania that I have to make a phone call and then they call me back and then an email and then I have to confirm <laughs> some other thing and then I don't get it for like three days. I so I mostly don't bother with it. He totally forgets about that account all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how can you hide money from yourself, right? How can you overcome the habits that you have and figure out other ways to be able to save. Because in the beginning, a lot of this stuff needs to be automated to get out of your own way. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's way smarter, yep. So $1,000, actually, if you break it down, what does it look like, right? Yeah, it's a choose your own adventure story. Yeah. You wanna <laughs> save $33 a day? Or $250 a week for a month, there's $1,000. That's kind of a lot. So if you want to get to that first thousand dollars in three months, it's eleven dollars a day or eighty three dollars a week. And with places like Ally, you can actually set up transfers weekly. You don't have to save just once a month. Mm -hmm. Right. And then if you want to get to that first thousand dollars for six months, can you set aside 40 bucks a week mm -hmm. for six months? Just don't even think about it. Just set it aside. Put it in that high yield savings account that's not connected to your bank. And can I ask you, those of y'all who are looking at this and saying this is still too much, $5.50 a day, $39 a week, can I ask you to make an experiment for yourself of like, what can I do to get to the first $100? Yeah. And that will be way less than, I guess that would be what, 55 cents a day or $3.90 a week. And that feels stupid, right? It, 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 it's okay. You, you know, you're like, oh, that, like, oh, four dollars a week this feels dumb right you know uh it, it's only dumb if you don't ever get to the thousand dollars and you have as long as you need to get there yeah. if it takes you a year if it takes you two years that's fine building the habit will allow you to build your savings i swear you start off with this i'm gonna save 50 cents a day thing and the next thing you know you're like that was actually kind of easy to save 50 cents. Maybe I'll save a dollar a day. And next thing you know, you're over that 550. Yeah. I mean, I had a client who thought who I, I suggested $50 a month. I was like, why don't you start there? And she was like, I don't even know if I can do that. Right. Two years later, she's regularly saving $500 a month mm -hmm. because she opened that savings account and she just started. And then when she got more money, she was like, oh, well, I'll put some more of it in my savings. You carved out a place to be able to save. And then you started the habit to do that. And that's really what this is to get to that first $1,000. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's all about habits. So where can we find the money? We have some ideas and we also would love for you to share as we're going through this. Um, what are the ways that you found to save? Yeah, well, we'll shout these out real quick and then KK will put on a couple of yeah. tunes and we'll come back. So, you know, you can automate your savings, even a small amount of automation, just like I was saying, that dollar a day stuff. Mm -hmm. You can think about saving more than once a month. Like Pam was saying, direct deposit straight oh, into your savings account. Now, yo, this is the John, yo. This is the best. This is like giving yourself a 401k, basically, right? You're like, okay, <laughs> okay kind okay, of, okay. right? Because with the 401k, it was so easy because you never saw in your paycheck, right? So you can actually set up direct deposit to split into your savings and your checking. However much you want to put in your savings, direct deposit automatically puts it there. You never even see it. There's micro savings apps like Digit and mm -hmm. Capital with a Q. There's saving windfalls. What we recommend is putting at least half of any extra income towards savings. More importantly than any of those percentages, have a plan for saving windfalls before they happen yes. because if you got it in your hand you're going to act different than if you make a plan yeah exactly and then figure out where you can cancel subscriptions cell phone bills cable bills if you can reduce any of those bills this is what this looking at a month's of living expensive stuff is going to do for you because you're going to find stuff where you're like have i been paying for this for a year and a yeah. half what happened and i will tell you if you cancel a subscription like a ten dollar subscription add $10 to your auto pay for savings. Don't just let that money go. Make it active and actively capture that savings. Cable is a rip off. That's yes. Right. That's right. Yo, that's so real. <laughs> I mean, you know, who has cable anymore? Well, it's one of those things that like, you know, a lot of these things are rip offs and it's as true. you I mean, Hulu and Netflix and Disney Plus and HBO Max. Well, and... <laughs> what you're going to find is you as you look at these things for real for real for yourself and you determine what's important to you and what matters to you, you'll be able to decide which rip offs you're willing to take and which ones you're like, "Nah, you need to go." And also this last one here at the bottom Bottom, this is one weird trick that visa hates <laughs> is prioritize your savings over everything over everything over your debt 
you see all these articles that they put out every other month. I see an article about this couple paid off fifty thousand dollars in their credit bill. And this family, they ain't got no kind of savings. They spent money for other people. They didn't pay themselves. And if yes. other stuff happens, they're gonna end up back in the same situation. Again, we're glamorizing spending money instead of saving. We're glamorizing paying other people instead of us. Yes. Tiffany, I have an account that I only put unexpected money into. Ooh. Oh, that's great. Tips, bonuses, tiny class action settlement oh, checks. Oh, yes. That is awesome. That's such a great tip. I want to give everyone a couple minutes. KK, if you want to, KK47, if you want to uh, take us till 8, 8.04. DJ KK47. Yes. We're on a couple of tunes. Please and share, please share your the tips. ones that you got going on. Yes. How do you find money to save? Or what is on this list that's worked for you? Mm-hmm. And pain, yes. I like sunshine and rain. Singing now, God's children joy. And pain, I like sunshine and rain. Rain, give it to Robin. checking account i have usda as my regular bank so i have another account that i can actually oh so that i have to have another account that i can actually visit a location oh yes ally bank does not charge ally bank is the only one on this list that actually is also does checking mm -hmm. yeah and they do not charge and they reimburse up to 15 dollars of your atm fees yeah but also uh ally doesn't have lo physical location oh ally doesn't have physical locations yeah. Um, so you can't deposit, you can deposit checks yeah, mobily. mobily, but I mean, same yeah. as USAA. Yeah. Same as USAA. Exactly. Yeah. So allies all online also. USAA is a really great bank to be working with because, you know, they work for the troops so that they treat them a little bit better. They do. They do. You have USAA. Yeah. I have USAA. Oh, you know, it, it's, it's really good. It holds you down. So we've been talking a lot today. Yeah. By the way, I'm loving all the love for DJ KK 47. Yeah. I mean, come on, you pulled out the the forgotten Rob Basin, DJ Easy Rock John, <laughs> Joy and Pain. So Come on now. That's that's what we're going through here. So whether it's joyful, whether it's painful, the things that we do repeatedly becomes our habits. Habits become tradition. Tradition becomes truth. Truth becomes common sense. That's why it's difficult for that family member to change a financial habit that you know is harmful and they know is harmful. You've been telling them for 10 years. Don't be doing that. Why are you still putting your money in the envelope thing? You know, the, the envelope, John, that they got going on. We can put it in the bank. And they're like, nah, because I got my system and my thing. These things become so ingrained. They are very difficult. That's why we ask y'all to examine these things. Figure out if your habits are helping you survive or are they going to help you get to the next step? Yeah. Are they helping you thrive? Are they getting you what you want? Or are they just stuff that you're used to? So again, we want to remind you, personal finance is a revolutionary act. When you prioritize yourself, when you put on your own oxygen mask first, Right, we like to say that savings is the financial version of putting on your own oxygen mask first. Then that's when you can start advocating for yourself, advocating for a community, and really starting to make change. Mm -hmm. Yes. So one last thing we would love y'all to share, and if you have any other follow-up questions, we'll stick around for a little bit afterwards. But uh, share something you learned today that you plan on working on, implementing, integrating into your life. Let's let folks know what we got going on. Yes. 
thanks for y'all being here with us too. We really appreciate it. It's been, yeah. it's been good. I've and been loving all the stuff you're saying. Our contact info, if you want to learn more about us, thank you, Wagner, for your email. We'll add it to the email list. If you want to get added to the email list, get reminded about these workshops, get our recipes for wealth, follow us on Instagram. You can text brunch to 33777. Yeah. And there are four more workshops. Yes. Every Wednesday, all through April, which is Financial Literacy Month, y'all. And National Poetry Month. Yes. So feel free to write a slam poem about financial literacy. Yes. Ooh, moving savings to American Express, yes. banking info and splitting stocks. I love it. So all good. Right. All right. All right. Thank you. Month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you to Brunch and Budget. We have four more workshops, y'all. Please, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. I'm going to remind all the registrants. I'll send the recording of our session and, and the slides. Please invite your community. Please, if you work with students, please bring your students to this. Uh, please invite their families. Uh, so this is a, a collaborative effort. Uh, financial Resilience, Five Stages to Your Financial Legacy is brought to you by Brookdale Community College's Community College Opportunity Grant, Financial Aid is Tuition Justice. Uh, talk about money. Talk about it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
to my guy and my woo 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 woo